tonight on All In. You are promising America tonight you would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. The indicted Republican frontrunner makes it official. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. Tonight, Donald Trump's stand back and stand by for dictatorship moment. The lesson of Donald Trump of the last several years has taught us is we have to take him seriously and we have to take him literally. Then a requiem for the last young gun. I'm the wrong guy to ask that question to. I never quit. The stunning resignation of the only speaker ever fired from his job. And my interview with the great Rob Reiner, remember the life and legacy of the incomparable Norman Lear. I would say he mattered, but only if I could help people understand that's true of all of us. Every day is another production. But All In starts right now. Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. As we near the official start of the 2024 election season, there is, I have to say, hearteningly, a growing awareness across the political spectrum that Donald Trump is running on an explicit pledge to be a dictator, basically, some form of presidential dictatorship. And if he wins back the White House, that he plans to smash American constitutional governance, that he will finish the job that he began on January 6th. There's a problem with campaigning on that platform. While preserving the Constitutional Republic might not be voters' top priority in polls, people do tend to be turned off by a candidate who runs around saying they will be a fascist dictator. And anyone in Republican politics with two brain cells to rub together understands that this is probably not the best approach if they want to actually win in an election, not just try to steal one. We've got hard evidence of this from many races over the past years, showing that the most strenuously pro-coup, pro-big lie candidates lose in competitive races time and time and time again. In fact, it was all those losses in the 2022 midterms momentarily startled some Republicans into thinking that, ah, it would be a mistake to nominate Donald Trump again. Alas, those days are gone. And now he is the party's likely nominee, certainly the front runner. He's far and away in first place, pulling higher than all his challengers combined in Iowa. Last night, Donald Trump was in Iowa, six weeks ahead of the first in the nation caucus, for a Fox News town hall. I should note, this was pre-recorded, presumably to make sure that any defamatory statements could be edited out. That's been a problem in the past with the guy. It was hosted by the one and only Sean Hannity, whose key central skill as a broadcaster is something that we like to call hanitizing. It's a classic Sean Hannity move, perfected over decades, to offer a softball stage-managed interview to a Republican trying to clean up after saying something offensive. So, Sean Hannity, who understands that running on a platform of dictatorship is probably not the most popular way to do it, tried to hanitize Donald Trump. It did not quite work out as he planned. I want to go back to this one issue, though, because the media has been focused on this and attacking you yeah. under no circumstances. You are promising America tonight. You would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. Yeah. Except Look, what? He's going crazy. Except for day one. Meaning? I want to close the border and I want to drill, that's drill, not a, that's, drill. That's not, no, no. that's not retribution. I got I'm going to be... I'm going to be, you know, he keeps, we love this guy. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. We're closing the border and we're drilling, drilling, drilling. After that, I'm not a dictator. So that, okay? that, that sounds to me like you're going back to the policies when you were president. That's All right, exactly take a break. Right. <laughs> okay, a few things jump out at me in that clip. First, note how Sean Hannity immediately tosses to a commercial break because he knows that it did not go well and he doesn't want to linger on it. Also, Donald Trump did not misspeak. He was offered up an opportunity on a silver platter right there in front of him, crafted for his tastes and delectation to deny that he has any interest in being an authoritarian. He could have just said, no, you're right, Sean. And he knew exactly what he was doing when he refused to do so. He wants his followers to know that, like them, he wants to end American democracy. Like them, he is excited by the prospect of being part of a violent and authoritarian movement, and he wants their support as he pursues that plan, just as he counted on their support in the past, most notably on January 6th. Of course, Trump has been explicit about his autocratic admiration and intentions all along. 
In 2016, he could have easily said, yes, of course I will accept the election results. But he didn't, because he had no intention of doing so if it didn't go his way. I want to ask you here on this stage tonight, do you make the same commitment that you will absolutely, sir, that you will absolutely accept the result of this election? I will look at it at the time. I'm not looking at anything now. I'll look at it at the time. That was big news at the time, remember? Really big news. Again, in 2020, Trump had an opportunity to condemn violent far-right groups like the Proud Boys. Instead, he directed them to, infamously, stand by. Are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups sure. and to say that they need to stand down and not add to the violence in a number of these cities? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. Supremacists Who would right you like me to white supremacists and right militia. White supremacists and right Proud militia. Boys stand back and stand by. The Proud Boys heard that message. It, it wasn't a, he didn't misspeak, stand back and stand by. He could have said, I condemn them. He could have said, I want nothing to do with them. No. He affirmatively said, stand back and stand by. And one of their own members testified to the January 6th committee. The group's numbers tripled after Donald Trump's comment. The ex-president deliberately chose those words. And of course, as we saw in all those debates and at the town hall last night, the crowd loves that stuff. That's the most important takeaway here. The MAGA diehards, the people who show up to that kind of event on a Tuesday night in Iowa, who show up to rallies, who showed up on January 6th, they want a dictatorship from day one. And make no mistake, that is exactly what Donald Trump is promising them. David Pluff served as campaign manager for Barack Obama's 2008 campaign as senior advisor to President Obama. Adam Server is a staff writer at The Atlantic, where he just published a piece about the peril of a second Trump term. They both join me now. David, I do think there's a, there's a political opportunity and opening here that I think is pretty key that Hannity senses in that moment <laughs> and that Trump maybe has some sense of, too, um, because he's trying to walk a line between saying, like, broadly, like, he thinks popular things, like, I'm going to drill and close the border. But it seems to me that the awareness of his authoritarian intentions need to be communicated to voters because all other things being said about them it's not a winning message, I don't think. What do you think? Well, sadly, it's probably a winning message for 40% of the country. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not going to get you the presidency. So, yeah, what's interesting is two issues that I think even Trump, but certainly his allies, identify as weaknesses, abortion and his embrace of autocracy and dictatorship. You know, Trump's now claiming he's going to moderate on abortion, which, of course, uh, is political insanity, given that he's the number one reason that Roe v. Wade was overturned. And then you see Sean Hannity trying to help him out. And it's crazy that Donald Trump could not handle a softball, couldn't, an couldn't answer uh, a leading question about not being a dictator. So, yeah, there's no question that this is going to be a very close election. Uh, and we don't know what's going to happen with the economy. But even if it improves, you know, that's going to be something Biden probably just wants to fight that to a draw, try to do better. Uh, but I think on these two issues of abortion uh, and democracy, I will say this. Those of us on the pro-democracy side of the question, I think, have to do a really good job of explaining what that means. So it's not just a shortcut. People don't have a lot of faith in institutions. Right. So you have to say it means we really won't have laws anymore. It means if you say something negative, you could be jailed. Uh, it means that basically one family, it'll be Don Donald Trump, and then Don Jr., and then Ivanka, and then Eric, and then Barron. Like, you have to make it real for people so they understand. Uh, so there's no question about that, that if you think about the people that helped deliver not just Joe Biden's election in 20, the Democratic wins in 18, the Democratic victories in 22, you know, they're, you know, absolutely going to be voters who, if they think there's a hint that Donald Trump could govern as a dictator, will oppose him. So, uh, you know, more to be seen there. But here's the thing. Everything we've seen, I mean, incoming members of his potential administration like Patel are out there saying, listen, we're going to investigate our opponents. We're going to go after the press. Yeah. Donald Trump himself has said he going to get rid of the Constitution. So, you know, we should not believe his fumbled misstatement on Sean Hannity. We should believe everything else around yeah. us. No, and there's a whole phalanx of, uh, you know, uh, chesty dweebs who, who like to go on whatever podcast they can find to bray about the fascist future that they're going to inaugurate, which, again, is like you have to take it seriously, but it's also like 
these are pathetic individuals. But it's also, Adam, I think it's a little bit, it relates to the, 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 the political weakness here, which I think the advantage has to be pressed on, which is a broadly the freaks and geeks problem. <laughs> the people like, uh, the people around the Republican Party, and particularly the upper echelons, like the Stephen Millers, the Cash Patels, these kinds of people that want to go on the Steve Bannon podcast and sort of like spin out their fascist fantasies. And when we saw when those people actually ran for office in 2022, you know, Blake Masters in, in Arizona comes to mind, like, the electorate, some portion, some crucial portion recoils. And, and it does strike me that Trump is in a different category because of his own political talents and how well he's known. But that, that vibe is sort of key, I think, for the battle for the center of the electorate. Yeah, most people are put off when someone starts talking like Skeletor. Right. <laughs> uh, I think if you look at Donald Trump, even in that clip, you know, there's a kind of wry humor to it. Yep. Uh, he wants to say something that sounds uh, menacing enough to be embraced by the people in the United States who would prefer not to have a democracy, but to have this, some sort of conservative autocracy. But he also wants to be able to joke about it. He wants people to freak out uh, and, he, yep. and he wants people to be able to sort of defend him in an almost uh, ironic way. Uh, a lot of his low-level functionaries and admirers don't talk like that. They talk like, you know, low-level technicians on the Death Star. Uh, <laughs> and I think that is off-putting to most normal people. Uh, the problem is that that Trump has, he, he has an understanding of that. He he, he understands the freaks and, and, and geeks problem, as you put it. Yes. Uh, and so he tries to make everything sound like a joke, even when he's completely serious. Yeah, that's, I, I, that is a very, I think, astute uh, observation here. There's also the question, too, about, like, what does it look like to engage on this question, David, right? So the, the President Biden has said, um, you know, he has talked about this. He talked about it in the 2022 midterms. He gave that big speech. He talked about it as a sort of theme during those midterms. That seemed to bear fruit. He's recently said that, you know, were it not for Trump, he might not be running again. I wonder, like, as a, as a as a at a technical matter, as a, as a sort of campaign messaging expert, what what the, how you do make that tangible to voters? What is the the message here about what this threat that can seem abstract is? Well, a couple of things, Chris. So one, audience matters first. So you know, this presidential election will be decided in seven states, basically by two sets of voters: the four to five percent swing voters in those states, and then a whole lot of Democrats who may not turn out. You know, this is true right. in every election. And I think this message about Trump bringing autocracy to America works with both of them. And so it's not many Americans, actually. So totally accomplishable from a tactical standpoint. And then the question is, I think messenger is probably more important than message. I think you need a lot of Republicans out there. You need a lot of, you know, former law enforcement people out there. You need just average people saying, this is what I'm worried about. One thing I'm concerned about is I think sometimes when we talk about democracy versus autocracy, uh, a lot of people think about it just through the stolen election and the coup and the insurrection. As important as that is, if Trump's actually going to get elected, that's going to be the least of our problems. Right. Uh, it's going to be what happened to real people when we have no institutions of rule of law in this country. So we need people to make that clear. Uh, and I do think that I very much agree with Adam. I mean, I think there's a sense that, well, Trump kind of jokes about this stuff. So some voters say, is he serious? Uh, and it's not like he had the Hall of Fame of kitchen cabinets, OK, last time to execute his wishes. But we know this about the guy. He doesn't like criticism. He doesn't like to lose. Uh, and so I think, you know, they are going to take this very seriously to go in there uh, and try and basically yeah. turn this into, I mean, we just have to look at who he idolizes around the world. Putin, Xi, the North Korean leader, Orban. So that's what we're going to get. So I think that the good thing is you're talking about at most two to three million Americans who need to be convinced yes. that the way to make sure America phase of democracy is not to vote for Donald Trump, not to vote for a third party. So numerically, it's an accomplishable task. Yeah. And, and, and Adam, you've got a piece about the, the sort of the, in this Atlantic special issue on the second term, you write about the judiciary specifically um, and, and just what it would mean. I think this is a really important point to make, particularly to those who may be wavering about their enthusiasm for the Democratic ticket or, or whether they want to vote. Um, just like the, the, the degree to which another set of those years to stack the bench with MAGA you know, judges what it would mean in, in a long-term sense for the prospects of American democracy. 
I mean, I think it means that basic freedoms that Americans take for granted would be forfeit to the extent that they clash with the conservative agenda. Uh, you know, what we've seen in the judiciary is a kind of a historical analysis that is meant to justify whatever stances define right wing cultural and political identity at a given moment. Uh, and in particular, you know, this is a very concrete thing when it comes to abortion. They want to be able to, yes. you know, read your most intimate communications. They want to control your body. They want to uh, figure out where you're going and why. They want to implement this sort of uh, system of surveillance and control to make sure that, you know, women can't decide whether or not they want to have a child. Um, and so that is a very concrete example of what we're talking about when we're talking about autocracy. We will have yes. a judiciary that is, you know, functionally committed to making sure that Donald Trump gets what he wants whenever he wants it, um, in part because, uh, you know, the conservative legal movement has been remade in his image uh, in, in this sort of anything goes way. Yeah. There are fellow citizens right now probably watching this program or not or just out there whose bodies have essentially been seized by the state under this vision of government against their will to carry to term or to continue to carry pregnancies that are non-viable. Like right now, there are people for whom that is their lived reality moment to moment. David Pluff and Adam Serwer, thank you both. Coming up after yet another mass shooting on an American college campus in just the last few hours, brand new information about the victims and the shooter at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. That's next. Don't go anywhere. Our hearts go out to the entire UNLV community. No student should have to fear pursue, pursuing their dreams. That was uh, moments ago. We were following breaking news in Las Vegas. After a gunman opened fire at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas earlier today, three people were killed. Another person was shot as, and is in stable condition at a nearby hospital. The gunman was killed at the scene. Police tonight say they have identified him, but are not releasing that information until next of kin are notified. NBC News correspondent, Lee, correspondent Emily Akeda is covering this story and joins us live with the latest. Emily, what do we know about what happened there today? Well, as you mentioned, the news conference literally just wrapping a few minutes ago, the sheriff describing the shooting as a heinous, unforgivable crime. And we're learning that the shooting first broke out on the fourth floor of one of the business school's buildings, and it continued on multiple levels. What police are really underscoring tonight, there is no more ongoing threat to the community in Las Vegas. As you mentioned, three people were tragically killed. A fourth person is in stable condition. Earlier today, we knew that individual was considered in critical condition, so that condition has since been upgraded. Several officers had sustained minor injuries as well, but still a lot of unanswered questions. We don't know whether these victims were students, staff, or other people. We don't know the ages or identities of the victims. And one of the things that police under underscore tonight is that the death toll could actually have been far worse, pointing out that there have been large gatherings in the area. This is a heavily trafficked portion of this large campus, UNLV. Had detectives not engaged the suspect as quickly as they did, the suspect was struck just outside of the building where the shooting had played out. They say that they know the identity of the suspect, but they're not releasing the name at this time until next of kin is notified. But sources are telling us the shooting suspect is a man in his 60s. To give you a sense, Chris, of just the chaos and confusion that played out earlier today. At one point, campus police had notified and told students and staff on the campus to, uh, quote, run, hide, and fight. Students describing barricading themselves uh, in classrooms, dropping to the floor, staying away from windows as this all played out. And then also in the nearby areas, we saw a ground stop at a major airport. We saw a major highway close temporarily as well. Now the focus will shift to the why. What led to, what was behind this uh, tragic shooting? President Biden reacting late today saying, quote, UNLV is the latest college campus to be terrorized by a horrific act of gun violence. And this is a city, Las Vegas is a city that is all too familiar with mass shootings. Remember just a few years ago in 2017, the Worst mass shooting in U.S. history played out just three miles from this campus on the Las Vegas Strip. Chris. Emily Aketa, thank you so much for that report. Really appreciate it. Jason Johnson's a professor of politics and journalism at Morgan State University and an MSNBC political contributor. He joins me now. And Jason, um, you are at Morgan State, which which had a shooting, uh, uh, I believe, earlier this year in the spring. Uh, well, it was just about six, seven weeks ago. Six, seven weeks yeah. ago. Um, and... That's right. And and you you have a sense of what it's like day two, day three, yeah. 
week four, week five, the reverberations of something like this on campus? They are massive. And I'm not just talking about sort of the increased security that you have for a while. Uh, the psychological effect on the students is, is immense. Most of them are still processing being out of the house for the first time. What is it to be safe in my dorm? What is it to be safe when I'm walking around a campus when I've been shot at? I have to mention, I spent a lot of this afternoon looking at TikTok of students here. There's a kid I saw named Jordan Lockett. I think I have his name properly. And literally with a TikTok saying, I left Chicago violence. Yeah to go to UNLV thinking I'd be safe and imagine having shootings like that here. So that's the kind of experience people have, even on my campus where no one actually died. What you have is students, they're afraid to go to class. They're concerned. I keep telling people we forget that these are these are pandemic babies, right? <laughs> for them, getting outside has been rough after being locked down for two years. And so there needs to be immense effort on campus for the psychological, emotional impact on the students and then the faculty because the adults are processing this. I am processing it on my own campus in a very different way than my students. Yeah, and, and one of the things, too, I mean, I've been to the UNLV campus. It's a big, open sort of public space in an urban environment. Right. Uh, Morgan State is in Baltimore and is also sort of embedded in the framework of the, of the city. And one of the great things about campuses is that they are big, open public yeah. spaces, right? Yeah. To the extent that you begin to garrison them, you take away precisely the thing that makes them such an amazing space to be in. And that, you know, you don't want to see that happen either. But, of course... These calculations in the mass shooting era are ones that all sorts of institutions have to make. One of the biggest issues that students talk about all the time on any campus around America is the militarization of the police and, and sense of protection, sense of unity. But here's the thing. If you have a mass shooter, the police do have to go dorm by dorm. Yeah. They do have to make sure no one's being held hostage. And there's no amount of security that you can you can't put a dome. Correct. Around a yes. campus, right? And that's the or real any fear. other part of American life. Any right? other I mean, part this of American is the thing life. Thing that we've we've learned when we've seen shootings in elementary schools, this sort of effort to harden the targets of uh, of schools. But fundamentally, there are going to be in a democratic society open spaces in which people congregate. And you have to have those open spaces for people to return to normalcy. But this is, this is one thing, Chris, I want everybody to understand, even when they're looking at the story, as they're, as they're hugging their kids and checking on their students and thinking of their own sort of experiences on campus, the reason behind the violence is not going to provide much security or peace. None. We're going to find out why this person did it, but it doesn't change how people are going to feel in a week. It doesn't change the number of students who don't want to take finals right now and the number of kids who may not want to come back in the spring. This point about motive is such an important one because there's always some sense that if you, you're going you're gonna to open up the box and inside is going to be some explanation. And having covered that mass shooting in Las Vegas, uh, the largest right. in uh, American history, there was nothing inside the box as far as we can tell. No. It was mass murder at a, at a sort of inconceivable scale done for reasons that remain opaque. And even if there were reasons, what, what, what does it do? It doesn't provide for the people that have been through this who are, who are processing the trauma any kind of um, comfort. No, no, no sort of peace for them. And I, I want to also point out this. Death is one particular thing that people fear. But injury is true as well. There, there's someone, you know, you yeah, can be shot absolutely. in the arm. You're still traumatized. That may be somebody who you went to class with. So we have to recognize that it's not just about death and violence. It's yes. about a sense of safety and how we turn that. All right, Jason Johnson, thanks so much for uh, joining us. I appreciate it. All right. Still ahead. In just a few months, Kevin McCarthy has fallen from speaker to announcing his resignation from Congress. Where did it all go wrong? What does it mean for the Republican Party next? You know that moment where you're watching a horror movie and a person goes down to the dark basement or, or out into the woods and you just instinctively yell, don't go down there. Of course, they always go down there. Just like Republicans always do in the era of Donald Trump, one after another, they walk into his arms, and you're watching, and everyone's warning, you probably don't want to do that. It's not going to end up well. And they do. And then their careers seem to end in humiliating fashion. Latest example, the third shortest tenured speaker in American history, Kevin McCarthy. He outlasted only a man who held the gavel for one day and a man who died of tuberculosis. So he has that going for him. McCarthy, like many, many before him, and like every other Republican, had his opportunity to cut loose from Trump after January 6. But with visions of the speakership in his head, he hopped on a plane just three weeks after the insurrection to the Florida retirement home, when Trump was at his lowest, to beg for an endorsement from a disgraced one-term ex-president. But even that pilgrimage did not buy him much. No persons having received a majority of the whole number of votes cast by surname, a speaker has not been elected. A speaker has not been elected. Has not been elected. Has not been elected. 
a speaker has not been elected. Kevin McCarthy of the state of California, having received a majority of the votes cast, is duly elected Speaker of the House of Representatives. Yay, Kevin, not a boy. The outfit changes there, not because she was doing a kind of share sort of thing, but instead because it took several days. Just nine months after that excruciating week, McCarthy was kicked out of the same job by a bunch of Trump-devoted MAGA nihilists, while his good body, Donald, did not lift a finger to help him. And since then, he's been hanging around as the lamest of lame ducks, clearly seething with rage, so much so that he was accused of shoving another congressman in front of a reporter while denying reports that he was leaving. I'm not resigning. I have more work to do, so. You're not resigning? No, I'm not resigning. So you'll stay the entire term? I'm staying, so don't worry. I got a lot you think you're not running for re-election? Yes. Yes, you will run, or you guys are thinking yes, about so running? We're going to keep the majority. I'm going to help the people I got here, and we're going to expand it further. <laughs> well, hmm. All that only announced today that, yeah, not only is he retiring, he's actually resigning. He's out of here. Done. Effective at the end of the month, leaving his successor with a three vote majority in the new year. Happy New Year. Just before two huge spending bill deadlines. As for McCarthy, he's heading to the political graveyard along the likes of Jeff Sessions and Paul Ryan and Mo Brooks and Mark Meadows and many, many. Claire McCaskill served two terms as the Democratic Center for Missouri. She's an MSNBC political analyst, and she joins me now. What do you think? What well, did you notice when, he, when he's, are you going to run again? He went, uh, yeah. It was, <laughs> like, right? it was like, I really don't Well, I guess I know. can't make news on that because I I'm clearly not, getting out of here. I, I, sure, I can't say no. Um, you know, I think the Republicans need to realize they've got a problem. Look at the history of speakers the Republican Party has produced, and look at what has happened. Going back to Gingrich, I mean, there's been scandal. Yeah. I mean, Ryan's the only one that legitimately served until the Democrats took over. Yep. Boehner got chased out in October yeah. after that, the, an election the previous November. So, meanwhile, Pelosi... And by the way, I don't want anybody to say, well, the Democrats are easier to keep together. No, they're not. No, they're harder, I think, by all. Yeah, of course. Yes. Or they're, they're, they're harder. There are structural factors that make them a more unwieldy coalition than the structural factors in the Republican. Correct. Side. But the difference is they really do want to govern and get things done. And so at moments when it matters, they stay together. Yep. And Pelosi was able to keep them together over some really rough waters. And Hakeem Jeffries has done a great job this year keeping the Democrats together. Meanwhile... I mean, what's the shelf life of Mike Johnson? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah. it, it, this isn't going to go well. It's not going to go well because either he is going to bring the Republican Party down in flames next November or they're going to move him out, too. We should we should you, you mentioned Paul Ryan, who is another one who basically was forced into the job of speaker by Trump. Right. Went and walked a humil set of humiliating planks where he, I mean, again, he was committed to the ideological cause of repealing Obamacare. It didn't work. But look at this. This is the Young Guns trailer for 2020. This is the former future of the Republican Party. Take a, take a look. There is a better way. And a new team is ready to bring America back. Eric Cantor, Kevin McCarthy, Paul Ryan. Joined by common sense conservative candidates from across the country. Together, they are ready to make history. Together, they are the young guns. I mean, now, 13 years is a long time, politics, a lot happened, but all gone. All gone. That entire universe of, of what was going to be the Republican leadership, what the Republican Party stood for, Patrick McHenry, who's a sort of lieutenant. Uh, of Kevin McCarthy, who served as Gone. speaker, he's also leaving. Um, and you can also understand why why people wouldn't want to stick around in that majority. Yeah, it, it, listen, it's not a pleasant place. Um, you know, I talk to my friends that are still in office in Washington with some frequency, especially on the Senate side. Yeah, it's not a pleasant place to be right now. It's really hard. So if you believe in things, if you have an ideology other than the personality cult of Trump. It's very hard to stick around because clearly the Republican Party doesn't stand for anything right now other than Donald right. Trump. And that's got to be really hard. And by the way, those young guns, not only is McCarthy out in record time, not only is Paul Ryan gone and making big bucks uh, on the board of Rupert Murdoch, um, but Cantor got beat. Yeah. I mean, he just beat 
beat. <laughs> well, period. he was well, and he was, and that when he was beat, he was beat uh, by, by a guy named David Bratt in a in a in a primary that sort of took everyone by surprise in a kind of sort of canary in the coal mine about Trump. I mean, really, it was, it was a your own voters hate you. Yeah. <laughs> the base of the Republican Party hates hates the people that they see as, as the GOP establishment. There is now just also a logistical issue that has, you know, when you speak about Mike Johnson, um, this is Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, doing her own vote counting. She's now sort of a proto whip. Well, now in 2024, we will have a one-seat majority in the House of Representatives. Congratulations, Freedom Caucus, for one and 105 rep who expel our own for the other. I can assure you Republican voters didn't give us the majority to crash the ship. Hopefully no one dies. Yeah, and by the way, the, Kevin McCarthy elevated her. Yes. I mean, this is not, not a well woman. No. I mean, this is not someone who... seem to me. It, well, in, in terms of the, our values and yes. the things I think most Americans believe in, yes. she is definitely out of the mainstream, Correct. way out of the mainstream. Very much. And now she is like a pseudo spokesperson for yeah, the she's Republican like, Party. Yeah, she's like part of the, she's, she's like running about, the Republican House. She's talking about being vice president. I mean, her whole book is a is an homage to how she should be vice president under Donald Trump. So, and McCarthy empowered her. Yep. McCarthy lifted her up. And the fact that she's staying loyal to him, I guess in some quarters may seem admirable, but it is scary to me that she gets the amount of tension she gets. I mean, the whole thing, every time we go through it, I said it was like a horror movie in the beginning, but it's just, it's such a cliche, the devil's bargain. Like, the devil's bargain is called the devil's bargain for a reason. It is a trope of the Western literary canon in which you are offered a thing and then they're going to have to pay back worse in the end. And we watch them do it over and over and over and over again, and eventually the devil comes calling, as he has for Kevin McCarthy. Claire McCaskill, thank you very much. You bet. Still to come, after the passing of TV legend Norman Lear, Rob Reiner joins me on why Lear's most flawed character has the most significance today. Ahead. One of the most inconvenient truths of American political life right now has to do with the U.S. levels of fossil fuel production. It's an inconvenient truth that, for different reasons, neither Democrats nor Republicans want to talk about. Here's the basic reality. U.S. oil production is off the charts. We are producing 13 million barrels of oil every day, which is more than Saudi Arabia and Russia. This week, we are on track to export 6 million of those barrels each day, which is a record high. That makes the U.S., get this, a larger oil exporter than any of the OPEC countries outside of Saudi Arabia. Now, the reason that the Biden White House isn't bragging about any of this is simple. It's a disaster from a climate perspective. It's terrifying, frankly, and it makes you worry if the U.S. is capable of hitting its targets from the Paris Climate Accords in order to prevent global temperatures from sliding past a point of no return into a wildly unsafe zone for human habitability. Republicans don't want to talk about U.S. oil because drill, baby, drill is supposed to be their idea, and they don't want to give President Biden any credit. So, you may have noticed, Republicans have largely stopped talking about domestic energy production entirely now that it's happening under a Democrat. Most Republicans, that is. There's always that guy at the end of the bar. We drill. You know, we drill, baby, drill. Drill, drill, drill. And probably on day, uh, on day two, we'll get rid of this ridiculous electric car mandate. We have to go and buy a car. We're going to buy a car. And uh, it doesn't go far. You know, there's a little problem. It's very expensive and it doesn't go far. In many ways, Donald Trump from Queens is a man of a bygone era. He's built an entire political persona after... Uh, oh, he has built an entire political persona on having the exact same worldview and level of knowledge as Archie Bunker from All in the Family. And on this day that we remember the legendary creator of that show, the man who sat across the living room from Archie Bunker, the one and only Rob Reiner will join me next. Legendary television producer Norman Lear has died at age 101. Lear is responsible for some of the most indelible TV shows of the 20th century, including The Jeffersons, Good Times, Maud, and Sanford and Son. He may best be remembered for the first show he developed, All in the Family, a sitcom built around Archie Bunker, played by Carol O'Connor, as the bigoted, oafish father-in-law who constantly butts head with his daughter's left-wing husband, played by Rob Reiner. What kind of a name is Stevie? <laughs> huh? Where are you from? Oh, uh, Chicago. I mean, what's your nationality? 
I'm an American. <laughs> I mean, where are your people from? They're from Poland. <laughs> that would make you Polish then. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Anything interesting in the paper? Yeah, 200 arrested at Vietnam Day peace demonstration. 200. They should have thrown a whole bunch of them in the can. Look at that picture there. Here they are, throwing all kinds of junk and debris at officers of the law, <laughs> desecrating on the American flag. What the hell are them peace things want, anyhow? Now, Archie Bunker is supposed to be lovable in spite of his flaws, not because of them, but to many Americans, his open racism and misogyny was something to be celebrated, even emulated. Which may explain why, as Norman Lear wrote in the New York Times last year, nearly 50 years after All in the Family first premiered, that America elected a man like Archie Bunker as its 45th president. Rob Reiner starred in Norman Lear's All in the Family. As you just saw, the two were lifelong friends, with Reiner calling Lear a second father, and Lear financing a number of Reiner's films, including This is Spinal Tap and The Princess Bride. Actor, director, and activist Rob Reiner joins me now. Um, it's such a great honor to have you, Rob. And first, just condolences uh, on the passing of a man I know that was was an enormous influence in your life. Yeah, no, he, I, like you said, he was a second father to me. I mean, uh, I was very lucky to have two men in my life that uh, were great role models. And Norman uh, showed me how you could use your celebrity, use your fame to uh, advance uh, issues that you cared about. I mean, I, I learned from him when he started People for the American Way that uh, you could accomplish a lot uh, by using your, your, your platform. And so I miss him already. I love him. Um, and I'm, you know, I've known him since I'm a little kid and, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be able to come on your show, uh, to talk about him because, um, you know, this is a man who he flew 57 bombing missions over Nazi Germany in the second world war. He fought his entire life for democracy mm. and against fascism. And we had so many conversations, even recently in the last couple of months, that he couldn't recognize the country that, mm. that he fought for so hard. And we now see ourselves on the on the verge of maybe slipping into fascism. And uh, it, it's just, you, you know, you can't wrap your head around uh, what's happened to this country and how a man like Norman, who fought so hard, uh, could see this happening. And, you know, he mentioned in that in that op-ed that, you know, that we've got a man like Archie Bunker in the, in the White House. But the truth of the matter is, Archie Bunker, he was a racist. He was a bigot. He was very conservative. But he was human. He loved his wife. He loved his, his daughter. He even loved his son-in-law, who he fought with, uh, you know, mercilessly. Donald Trump is not. He doesn't have any feelings. He's not human. He's a psychopath. And he has the makings. And you guys have been talking about it for days now. This man, and he says it, he's a fascist. He wants to rule as an autocrat, as a dictator. And we have a big choice. And I love that I can come on your show and talk about this because, <laughs> you know, to speak for Norman, that we have a choice. We can either choose fascism or democracy, and that is it, and that's simple. And, you know, we, we can argue about issues once we've saved the democracy. Yeah, let me, let me read from something he wrote about this, uh, about authoritarianism. Um, uh, he says, uh, you know, as a young man, I dropped out of college when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. I flew more than 50 missions in a B-17 bomber to defeat fascism consuming Europe. I'm a flag-waving believer in truth, justice, and the American way, and I don't understand how so many people who call themselves patriots can support efforts to undermine our democracy and our Constitution. It is alarming. And one of the things I, I find so remarkable and admirable about his career is here's a guy who was, you know, a, a stalwart liberal his whole life, outspoken, who managed to sort of pull off this very difficult thing, which is to sort of live his politics and to navigate the studio system and the bosses and to make great entertaining, funny television, all of which that embody his worldview, which is, you know, probably better than anyone, threading those needles is, is just 
astoundingly difficult. And for him to do that yes. time and time again over the decades he did is, is, is just a stupendous achievement. It, it is. And what you say is exactly true. It is incredibly difficult to be able to deal with real characters, with real issues that are facing all of us, to present both sides. One of his favorite uh, uh, plays of all time was Major Barber by George Bernard Shaw. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't know that Shaw was a liberal and you saw that play, you'd say, well, he presents both sides, the yeah. pro-war, anti-war uh, case in, uh, equally. And that's what he wanted to do with all the family. He wanted to give people a chance to see both sides, to have the discussion, and then talk about it. And we were a nation of 200 million people at the time. And if you wanted to watch the show, you had to watch it when it was on. There was no TV, DVR, TiVo or anything. You had to watch it. So that means 40 to 45 million people every week had a shared experience. And we talked about yeah. the issues. You know, you know, we're so fractured and we don't really get to talk to each other. We have one side, you know, I say, I disagree with Liz Cheney. But I'm on the side of Liz Cheney when we decide we want to save democracy. Let's talk. Let's argue about the issues uh, when once we save democracy. But right now you got you don't have a Republican and Democrat. You have you got Democrats and then you've got, you know, it's like I said, you want to have an argument about an issue. You have to both agree that two plus two is four. Right. Then once you agree to that, then you can discuss. But we have one party that says two plus two is four, and the other party that says two plus two is Thursday or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and we're now, and we're, and that's the way Norman working he would get a laugh out of it, you know. And it is the toughest thing in the world to do what he did. An incredible, incredible career. And also, from every account I've ever heard of the Maya, just a, a true mensch, just a truly decent dude. Rob yes. Reiner, um, yep. thank you so much for sharing a little bit of your uh, memories of, of, of a great man that we lost. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Chris. That does it for All In. You can catch us every weeknight at 8 o'clock on MSNBC. Don't forget to like us on Facebook. That's facebook.com slash All In With Chris.